This video is sponsored by LearnSQL.com. More about them later on. In this third and final part of the Learn Basic SQL in 15 minutes series, we're going to be learning how to use different SQL functions to both clean data and create new fields from existing data. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome to Learn BI Online with me, Adam Finer, helping you do more with data. If you haven't already watched parts one and two yet, I'll leave links to them in the description below. But don't worry, you don't necessarily need to have watched those before watching this. You'll also find timestamps in the description for you to skip around the video. Okay, so far in parts one and two, we've seen how to ask databases to return specific data in and across tables, and also how to create and populate new tables. In this video, we're going to be using SQL functions to manipulate existing data and create new fields. These new fields can be useful for things like grouping column values together, creating new column values, and also cleaning data so that it's easier to analyze. Without any further ado, let's jump onto my computer and get started. Here we are again in Navicat, my tool of choice for managing and querying SQL databases. I'll add a link to it in the description. The first few functions we're going to look at are mainly used for manipulating column values in order to clean them. Cleaning data basically means correcting poorly formatted or incorrect data so that it can be analyzed. Sometimes data can become poorly formatted when it's copied from one place to another, or if the data has been manually entered by different people. In both these cases, you would need to clean the data by making all values uniform so that they can be aggregated properly. One of the most common things that can happen when data is migrated from one place to another is that extra spaces are added either before or after values when they're copied. When you look at data, one value with extra spaces at the end and one without look identical. Except as far as SQL is concerned, they're not. They are two separate unique values. So you couldn't aggregate them without removing the extra spaces first. To do this, we need to apply what is called a trim to the column values. The first two are ltrim and rtrim that will remove the blank spaces from the left and the right of the value respectively also known as leading and trailing spaces. The third function is just trim that will simultaneously remove both leading and trailing blank spaces. Let's see an example. Here in Navicat, I have some sales data. First, I've written a query to return all of the different values contained in one of the columns of my table. Here it is. If this query looks like a foreign language to you, you'll want to go and watch part one of this series. I'll add a card to it on the screen or just check the video description for the link. But basically, I'm asking the orders table to return a count of values in the first column of the result and the segment column in the second. Then we're aggregating the result by the segment column. And this is the result. It shows us that there are four different values in the segment column of the table. But we can see that there are two consumer values that look identical, but that are actually different due to trailing spaces. The way we can fix this and clean the data is by using the trim function on the relevant column, like so. We give the new trimmed column an alias and use that in the group by. When I run the query again, you'll see that there's now only one value for consumer in the result. Job done. Because the problem was with trailing spaces, I could also have used the rtrim function to achieve the same result. The next functions we're going to look at are left and right. Their job is to return a specified number of characters from either the left or the right side of a column value. In our data, we have an ORD ID column that has a two letter code at the beginning, either US or CA. If we wanted to create a new column that contained just this two letter code, we could use the left function. The way the function works is that you specify the column first, comma, the number of characters to return, like so. And we'll call it order underscore cat. Then, if you remember from the part one video, we'll need to add this new column to the group by as well. 
let's beautify our SQL and run the query again. You can now see from the result that we have the order category for each of our segments. That was the left function. The right function allows you to do the same thing, but specifying characters on the right of the value. Next up, we have LPAD and RPAD. Yes, again, these functions will apply transformations to either the left or the right of the value. Their potential use cases are fewer, but their job is to pad out column values to a specified length of characters by inserting other characters. In our data, we have the zip code column that contains values of differing lengths. If we wanted to make them all the same length by perhaps adding in leading zeros, we would use the LPAD function. The function has three arguments. Firstly, the column name, then the desired total length of characters, and finally, the character string to pad out the value with. So in this case, we're padding out on the left zip code to a length of five characters with the string zero. When I run this, you can see that leading zeros have been added to zip codes under five characters. One thing to note with these pad functions is that if you specify a pad length of characters that's less than the number of characters in the value itself, only the specified pad length of characters will be returned, thus truncating the value. OK, moving on now to a much used function that helps you to extract a string of characters from column values. The example I'm giving here is that for our order ID, we want just this four character number here in the middle. In order to do this, I would use the substring function. It has three arguments. Firstly, the column name we're extracting the string from, then the start position, and finally, the length or number of characters to be returned. So in our example, we would write substring order ID, comma, four as the starting position and four as the length. As you can see from the result, just the characters we've asked for are returned. One function that's commonly used in conjunction with substring, and we'll look at an example in a minute, is called length, which returns, as it suggests, the length of characters contained within a string. Here, I've selected the customer name field, and now I'm going to ask for length customer name. The result shows the number of characters contained in each customer name. One thing to note is that these functions could also be used in the WHERE clause of the SELECT statement. For example, I could say where length customer name is greater than 20. And we can see that only one of our customers has a name that long, and it's Christina van der Zanden. And now I'd like to say a big thank you to LearnSQL.com for sponsoring today's video. If you want to learn or practice SQL, check out LearnSQL.com. They have a set of over 50 hands-on SQL courses. This unique platform offers a 100% online experience with nothing to install. Everything happens through your favorite web browser. All of the courses are interactive and based on real-life business scenarios, meaning you'll be writing SQL queries and seeing the results instantly. Do you want to become a data analyst or encourage your company to be more data-driven? LearnSQL.com is the place to go. You'll find a link to LearnSQL.com in the description below for you to check out their offer and choose one of their learning paths in SQL, PostgreSQL or T-SQL. With LearnSQL.com, learning SQL has never been easier. OK, so the next function we're going to look at is called locate, which, in my SQL at least, is synonymous with another function called position. Its job is to return the location or position of a specified string of characters within another. For example, I could ask to return the position of the first instance of a space in a string, like this. It has two arguments the string you're looking for, comma, the column you're searching in. And you can see the result here. You may at this point be asking why this might be useful. And in our next example, I'm going to show you. Here we have a column containing our customer first and last names. This data was originally collected in two separate fields, but for reasons unknown, they have since been combined into one. So how would we split them up again? 
Well, to do this, we would need to use a combination of functions that we've already looked at. Can you think of which ones might do the job? If we think about the logic behind what we need to do, for the first name, we would need to create a substring that starts at the very left and stops before the first space. For the last name, we would need to create another substring that starts after the first space and continues until the end, or last character. Let's deal with first name first. We'll be using the substring function, and if you remember, it has three arguments. The field we're creating the string from, the start position, and the length. The field is customer name, the start position is 1, i.e. the very first character, and for the length, we're going to need to use another function to locate where the first space is. I'm sure many of you following along will know where I'm going with this. We're going to use the locate function to locate the first space in the customer name field, like so. But there is a problem with this, and it's not obvious when we look at the result in that the result includes the space in the length of the specified string. What we really want to do is to stop one character before the space. Well, that's easy. I'll just add minus one to the end. So what about the last name? How do we create a new field for that? Well, we'll do something similar as for the first name, only this time we'll locate the space and add one for the starting position, and in terms of where to end the substring, we could use the length function, because that will essentially return the position of the last character by saying how long the original string is. So length, customer name. And there we have our customer names split up. But we have another problem. Our first and last names are both in lowercase format. How do we capitalize them and make them all uppercase instead? For this, we have the upper and lower functions. Really easy to use. Let's just put an upper function around our existing first name to see it in action. But what about capitalizing just the first letter of first and last names? Now, that's a bit more complicated. Again, you would need to use a combination of the left, upper, lower, and length functions, and then concatenate them together using the concat function like this. So you're uppercasing the left first character and concatenating that with a substring that lowercases everything from character 2 until the end. Simple! Okay, so it's a lot to take in, but that's the beauty of video. You can just rewind and watch again. Or why not just hit pause, go make yourself a cup of tea or a coffee, and then come back for the next bit. I promise I won't go anywhere. Just kidding, let's keep going. So, so far we've looked at functions that can be used to manipulate and transform existing data values. Now we're going to look at how we can use conditional expressions to, among other things, group column values together into new values and fix errors like misspellings in data. In fact, these are the two examples we're going to look at, starting with correcting misspelled values. Someone in our team has just noticed that in the data, the state of Ohio has been misspelled with an S at the end. All the other states are spelled correctly, so we just need to correct that one. To do this, we're going to use the case function. Here's how. We start with the word case, and then when, state, like, Ohio's, with an S, then, Ohio, else, state, and end. You'll need to have an end for each case statement. So essentially, it's an if-then-else statement, saying that if, or when, the state contains the string Ohio's, then return the string Ohio instead. Else just return the value in the state column as it is. When we run the query, we can see the original and the fixed values. Now we're going to use another case statement to group together rows in the product name column into different brands. Xerox, Acme, and Avery. 
Like with the last example, we're going to say when product name like Xerox, between percentage signs to signify that the search string can appear anywhere in the value, then Xerox, else, other. So assigning anything that doesn't contain Xerox into another group called other. When we run this, we can see that everything has been assigned correctly. In the same case statement, you can have as many when statements as you like. So for Acme and Avery, I'll just copy and paste the Xerox one and modify the values. What we could do then is to remove the original product name column from the query, add a count star column and group by brand. This way we can see the number of rows that contain each of the four values. Or I could replace the count star with a sum quantity instead to see how many units of the brands were sold. Okay, one final example we'll look at is this one. Case when profit greater than zero, then loss, else no loss, end. This will split up the values into two categories based on whether the profit value is less than zero or not. If you'd like to get your hands on a cheat sheet I've created to accompany this video, check out the description. And that's it for this third installment of Learn Basic SQL in 15 minutes. If you haven't already checked out the first two parts, here they are. Once you've learned and understood everything that I've shown you, you'll have an excellent base to dive deeper from. And if that's your aim, why not visit our sponsor, LearnSQL.com and check out their courses. That's it from me. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you soon for another video.